Good afternoon, everyone. And if I could just add, um, um, good afternoon, everyone. If I could just uh, add my thanks to Sarah's thanks for everyone who's attending this afternoon. I know everyone is very busy. Uh, I'm hugely encouraged by the interest that this symposium uh, seems to have generated because at the charity, we believe peer support is one of the most important care interventions that isn't actually detailed or formally specified in the national specification and therefore not one of the main commission services. Um, and we'll hear about the patient perspective of just how important it is a little bit later from Richard. Certainly my experience in other long-term conditions, but in renal as well, talking with our patient support and advocacy team. Um, when a patient talks to another patient, there is a, a relaxation and understanding that someone really does understand because of their own lived experience. Um, but because it's not commissioned, because it's not seen as an imperative, it's why there isn't universal access to the highest quality peer support right across the UK. And um, 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 Nikki and Larry will be talking about um, the, the findings of the audit research we did just to see you know, how widely there is some form of formal peer support programmes across the United Kingdom. Um, however, there are fantastic examples and many different models of peer support being delivered to an incredibly high standard, usually led by individual champions, such as many of you who are on this call today. And it does too often, I think, it gets left to individuals, which can cause sustainability a problem. I'm sure we've all been in situations where uh, a trust can have a very strong peer support program and a year later or a couple of years later, it appears to have disappeared. And I think it's that creating a substantive and sustainable change that puts peer support right at the heart of patient intervention, experience and outcomes. Um, we did try to get the RSTP to, to put it as part of our psychosocial work, but as I'm sure everyone's aware, there were so many priorities within the transformation programme that peer support didn't quite make it to the top of the pile. And I think this symposium is a start of a process where we can actually start to drive it without the Renal Services Transformation Plan. And we do think that by bringing together leading experts and champions, we can explore how we go about raising the profile of peer support. How can we ensure that all patients have equity of access to the highest quality of care? So we have set three aims and objectives. Um, is to hear from experts in peer support, to learn from those experts, to discover how to kickstart, revitalize, or provide extra support to your own peer support programs, but then to discuss ways that we can move forward. Maybe we could talk about becoming part of an expert community, a network of interest that brings together all the uh, uh, champions of peer support to work together to improve services. So I hope everyone enjoys what, as Sarah says, should be a very rich experience. And I think at that point, I'll hand back to Sarah. Um, Sarah, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Um, and we're going to go straight into um, hearing from Richard, Richard Endicott, who is going to share the power of peer support from a peer supporter's point of view. Um, so Richard, if I can hand over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, can I just have the first slide up, please? Thank you very much. Um, so just a quick uh, uh, overview, really, of two aspects of peer support. Um, the, the first is really looking at um, uh, peer support and, and, and really what, what I see is the crucial elements. Paul's just alluded to some of those, and I'm just going to have a quick look as it, uh, at um, some, some of those uh, um, crucial elements this afternoon. Uh, and the other aspect I wanted to look at was really what has been my own experience with using uh, uh, and meeting um, a peer support within my own unit. But just a quick look at myself. Um, uh, I've been a patient for 40 years at, uh, the, at Bart's in the Royal London. Um, uh, yes, it's a long time. Um, and uh, I've had two transplants in that time, both in 1990 and in uh, 2019. And I've also had a variety of dialysis in that time, depending on which suited me best. Um, I was diagnosed with FSGS in the mid 80s. 
And um, I, it's fair to say, uh, looking at peer support, <laughs> is that it, it really probably wasn't, it well, certainly wasn't called peer support in those days, and was probably called um, uh, something like uh, patient education um, or patient support. And it, and it was very much in its infancy. And certainly when I first started going to hospital, um, uh, there was quite it was quite scant the information and and the information I was given uh, was probably not that active in that it, I came across it and the, the the staff were very good with providing me with information I but often had to ask for it or see if it was available and a lot of that information was really pamphlets or 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 handouts uh, um, uh, and this type of thing and and of course we just didn't have the luxury of things like computers in those days where of course Google is just there ready for us to use and we can just access practically anything we want um, and I've been a peer supporter for a number of years now with that trust so uh, next uh, slide please so I just wanted to look at what I saw as the main elements of being a peer supporter. And um, uh, I just wanted to, in a short amount of time that I got available, is, is really allude to a couple of really important um, uh, uh, things that I feel that we, we, we try to provide as, as much as we can. Um, the, the, the whole foundation of peer support is, is, is really about um, sharing similar experiences. Um, I, I think uh, as a peer supporter, we're really in a unique situation in that we, we have, um, when we sit alongside the patients that we meet, um, the situation is unique because we, we've trod that road with them. We, we, we've, um, we've understood that um, what, what they've been through, their challenges, the changes that often come with a chronic condition um, uh, is very, very difficult. And for a lot of patients, particularly with say something like acute renal failure can find their whole world upside down. And there is no doubt that um, these conversations that we have is that we can um, sympathize, empathize and, and understand where the patient is sitting at that moment in time. And uh, that's a huge advantage for you, uh, for us, I should say, as peer supporters, because we can totally understand because the chances are we have been there ourselves. And there's a whole range of things we may look at. And um, th there's no doubt that when patients meet us, they've probably got hundreds of questions and uh, I'm, I'm probably at that time not had that many answers. And, and one of the things we're able to do is I think prioritize some of that information. Um, patients are often overwhelmed with what they want to know and they need to know it now almost. And, and, and what I feel that we can do is, is, is try and break that down into what's important to, to, to the patient at this particular time. Often it might be, well, communicating with my family. Maybe it will be communicating with my employer. Um, so there's practical advice. But what often overrides that uh, um, from my experience has been that the overriding issue for them in terms of dealing with things is that they're frightened. Fear is something that particularly when you're newly diagnosed just follows you everywhere. And it is, is that fear which brings anxiety, which therefore makes life very, very difficult. And touching upon those is quite difficult. But if you're a peer supporter and you can, and you can talk about what, what that, where their anxieties are coming from, that can really help open some um, roads ahead so that you can talk about other things. And um, there's no doubt that during those first few um, uh, meetings that we have um, that you do prioritize on the areas and um, because what you want to do is bring back some confidence reassure people that you don't need to be this frightened because well one I have been there and this is what happened to me and hopefully those are going to be positive outcomes and um, if you can quell their anxiety there is no doubt that your role as a peer supporter is going to be very much easier and um, what you're steering towards, I feel, is trying to get people to 
be proactive themselves you know this is where you get the information from you, you know go and find it or you provide it for them themselves and so overall as a peer supporter if you can understand where people are and and sit alongside them hold their hand if you want sometimes i don't mean literally of course but uh, you know guide them through these difficult phases then you are really going to make a huge difference to their lives and um if people can find their own answers you, a lot of your job i i feel has already been done so supporting your patients um, and I've only just talked about a couple of things, and there's many more things that we can do, is, is overall our, our own aim, really, as a peer supporter. Next slide, please. So just flipping things around a little, um, uh, I just wanted to just really look at things from, a, a, from my own experience with, with, with peer support. Um, it's fair to say, I think, in the beginning, um, I didn't seek much help um, back in the 80s. I, I think I just didn't come across it really. It wasn't that proactive in, in my hospital at that time. And, um, uh, I, so, so, and I did come across some information, but I certainly didn't meet any patients. Um, the, the big change for me and the big impact came for me um, was when um, I, I was a, a starting dialysis and about to move on to dialysis. And, um, I knew very little about dialysis, and it was then that I was uh, introduced to various people to talk about the, the particular, and it was PED that I started with, um, that, uh, I, and I knew nothing about this um, from a patient perspective, um, that uh, I needed to know more. And um, when I met patients who were on PED, some of them for quite a, a length of time, I just found it so interesting so useful so beneficial to just understand what it meant to them because that would by by reflection probably be well, what it will mean to me as well and they certainly helped me enormously in understanding how they coped what the challenges were what to look out for what the advantages disadvantages um uh what their daily uh what their daily lives looked like and so i would try and marry up what their lives were like and what my life could look like uh, as well and when i went to see members of my own renal team i i was sort of armed up with things and and, and that was a that that was a, a a huge advantage for me um because i could start thinking for myself a bit and more importantly i could make informed decisions about what i I would like to try and do because I felt with talking with these patients this was going to help me and um, uh, that that really did make a difference and I, I, I think looking back now that, that what people the people I met certainly were really instrumental in what the, the, the direction I took um, so just before I close off um, one of the things which I, I look back on and, and feel was so important and so vital was that when I talked to these people, they were often very positive. And that when I spoke to them in my early days, when I was, you, you know, probably quite frightened still, and certainly when I was going on to dialysis, that um, they said that having a positive mindset was just so important. And there was no doubt their positive mindset rubbed off and, and helped me have a positive mindset as well. And often they would say when I'd meet them and that really life on dialysis or life with a, a long term condition is, is really controlled and, and, and cared for up here more than anywhere else. And so they really did help me um, find the right balance. And so uh, just before I go, I would say to those people who are patients listening, uh, certainly, or who could even be interested in um, becoming involved with uh, peer support, is that for a patient, please search them out. They, it would, you, you'll be surprised about how, how much they can help you. And if it's something you would be interested in doing yourself, please contact the, your unit. We can never have enough people who are able to help us. So um, there's no doubt you can get on with life for sure um, and uh, live a very, very normal life. And I tell you what, um, peer support will help you do it.
Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. That's a, a, a really powerful introduction to what this is all about and, and the difference that it makes to people's lives. So thank you for that. So now I'm going to hand over to Larry Wood and Nikki Thomas, who are going to take us through the evidence behind this. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm Nikki Nikki Thomas. I'm a kidney nurse and professor at London South Bank University. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Aliri um, is a fantastic colleague of mine. We, we worked together quite a lot. And um, in 2019, we received some money um, very kindly from Kidney Care UK to undertake a project around peer support. And there were three parts to the project, um, a survey to staff, and uh, to, uh, to staff, yes, and then we interviewed um, staff and patients with the aim to develop resources, a toolkit uh, to support peer support across the UK. But we're here today just to report on the survey that we carried out in 2019. Next slide, please. So you can see from this slide, um, we've defined peer support there. We needed to define it in order to ask people about their experiences um, in trusts. So uh, you can see we defined it as an activity which is um, uh, for, for those with shared characteristics, conditions or circumstances um, in, so that they can support each other. And um, the activity provides informational, emotional and appraisal support. We knew before the survey that many um, kidney specific peer support programs had reported lower than expected levels of uptake. So we were very interested in that. And also Larry had already taken um, a national survey in 2012. So of course, seven years later, we were interested in, in the differences across that time period. Next slide, please. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was the animation before we wanted. Thank you. Uh, so the aim of the survey was to um, really determine the availability of peer support um, across the UK. And as I mentioned um, about this, how the situation had changed since 2012. And we, um, to build on the 2012 survey, we also had some additional questions about evaluating the barriers and drivers of peer support programmes uh, to really understand uh, in the longer run how we might overcome some of those. Next slide, please. So I'm going to report on some top level results and then Aleri is going to break them down a little bit. So you can see we tried very hard to um, uh, send the surveys to all the renal units across the UK. We had just over a 50% response rate, which was fantastic. We were really delighted uh, with that. And you can see from the um, simple pie chart there that um, it was broken down in, into three areas. So um, overall, about 70 odd percent of units, those units who responded had some form of peer support, but that was broken down into informal and formal peer support. So you can see how that's uh, broken up in the pie chart. Um, and almost 30% sadly didn't provide any type of peer support at all. Uh, what was interesting, you'll see that last bullet point is that only five units, so 11% of the units who replied, had a mandatory part of their service provision to be peer support. And maybe we can unpick that a little bit later, um, how we can mandate it across units in the UK, because clearly the evidence is there about, about its benefits. Next slide, please. So just a tiny bit more detail um, about the survey. So the first thing is about what type of support um, people were providing. So you'll see there it's divided up into information giving, emotional support, and taking that a step further in terms of shared decision making. And some, some um, programmes offered all three, whereas some just ordered, uh, offered one or two of them. And you'll see the areas of support there on the right hand side of the slide. So advanced kidney care, dialysis um, and, and you'll, you'll see you'll see the breakdown uh, for yourself. Next slide please. And the final bit for me is really a little bit about how the peer support programmes were offered. Now remember we're in the context of pre-pandemic um, and later we might be able to discuss you know how peer support um, was offered during the pandemic when everything was remote but at this time you can see that um, there's a bit of a breakdown there with face-to-face -face on a one-to-one -one level, face-to-face -face in a group or individual via telephone. So you can see the, the, the different percentages there. 
And the final thing for me is what's interesting is about the funding. And maybe that's something we can pick up again later, but you'll see that there's a variety of funding models um, ranging from the charity, uh, presumably mostly Kidney Care UK or maybe Kidney Patient Association funding um, and, and other, other areas, some renal units, for example, fund it themselves. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Ilary now. Thanks, Nikki. So once we've got some sort of basic information about the nature of peer support in each of the kidney units, we asked our survey respondents what either helped or hindered them to have successful peer support on offer. So to talk you through what we termed the drivers for peer support success, this slide shows, um, though I appreciate you, you may have to squint a little bit to read what, what the reported drivers were. Um, coming out top was that promoting peer support amongst the healthcare professionals in that unit was a really big driver for peer support success. Um, and probably part of that um, were the next two drivers, which both state that um, units found it very useful to have a champion for peer support. Um, so someone who understood peer support, was really enthusiastic about its benefits, and who was familiar with, with how it worked and could champion it to all of the other people in the unit. And um, the, our respondents said, that they were sort of pretty much equally keen on whether that was a staff member who was a champion or a volunteer patient who was a champion or preferentially both. Um, another driver for peer support success was having a service which was accessible. And I think by this, um, there are sort of two sides to making your service accessible. One is that having um, a sort of straightforward referral process, not something convoluted will obviously help it be easier to access and more successful. Another aspect of making a service accessible is offering your peer support in different formats. So as was shown on the previous slide, having um, different ways in which patients can actually receive peer support, be that face-to-face -face or telephone groups and individual, that was another way in which you were more likely to have a successful service by offering in a range of formats. Um, a couple of the other drivers which were um, quite commonly mentioned were re with regard to training um, and particularly having within your own unit means of training both health care professionals about what peer support is and how they can access it and why they should be offering it to patients and another kind of training which is training for potential volunteer patients to actually train them up to be peer supporters. Having means of providing that training in-house um, was very much reported as a common driver for peer support being successful. Moving on to the next slide, please. We started looking at the barriers preventing um, some units perhaps being as successful in peer support as they would like to. And we, I'm going to tell you about the responses to that in two different groups. So firstly, these are responses from kidney units who had no peer support available. And their main reported barriers related to other projects taking priority. Um, and that speaks for itself. We do know that peer support isn't the only important thing um, that uh, healthcare professionals in renal units are trying to make happen. Um, and certainly it hasn't been prioritized um, sort of across the board and, and that has prevented it getting off the ground in, in many units. Another big barrier which was reported was that nobody came forward to be that lead, to be that champion. Um, and I think that relates to the next two barriers that you can see on this slide, um, which are that there was a lot of uncertainty about, well, well, what would I do? And clearly people are gonna be unwilling to come forward um, to lead a peer support service if they, they don't know how to do it and they don't know where to go for that information. Um, and then staff time, so having the time to come forward and to take a lead in driving forward peer support or being that champion, um, they were big barriers and, and obviously very understandable. Another one that was mentioned um, quite frequently was the cost, the financial cost of setting these things up. And again, as we've shown um, in a previous slide, different units have sort of tackled that in different ways, but there's no, there's no centrally commissioned pot of money for peer support. 
Um, and then a lack of guidance and information being available. So that relates back to people being uncertain about how to do it, and but then not even knowing where to go for that information. If we move on to the next slide, please, then there we're looking at barriers which were reported from units who have some peer support up and running. So that includes um, a lot of the similar kind of um, barriers. So lots of people said that they didn't have adequate time to do so, which we understand life is extremely busy in renal units. Um, and again, there was a lack of knowledge about where to go for guidance. So they were saying that where is the information? We don't know it, we haven't got it. Um, and other projects, again, were taking priority. Um, some units mentioned that they didn't have enough patient volunteers and some mentioned that cost was an issue as well. Next slide, please. So comparing those findings from 2019 with 2012, unfortunately, we could see that the proportion of units without peer support increased just by a small amount, but it increased. Um, and the portion of units with formal peer support was static. Um, just to define that, because that may not have not yet be clear to some of you, we use the term formal peer support when we are talking about um, a program where volunteers are trained and receive ongoing sort of support and there's, there's governance in place. Informal peer support is the term that we use when Patients are certainly put in touch with each other so that so that they can receive support from each other, but there's 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 no governance, there's no training, there's no, there's no um, sort of regulated pool of peer supporters. So unfortunately, the situation has been rather static. And the same applies for barriers, that many of the barriers that were reported in, were reported in 2012 were exactly the same barriers that were coming up in 2019. Next slide, please. Um, so our conclusions were some suggestions about what could be done about that. You know, the fact that um, nationally peer support hadn't progressed um, over those seven years by any significant amount. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, we as a project team, so myself and Nikki um, and the others who are working on this, uh, set up a toolkit to help tackle some of those barriers. So we're very grateful that Kidney Care UK agreed to host this toolkit on their website. Um, the toolkit contains a lot of information about what peer support is and, and why it's good in case you or anyone else who you're working with needs convincing on those fronts. It contains guidance about what you need to think about if you're setting up a service or what you need to think about if you're trying to bring your service um, up, up a notch, up a gear. And it contains lots of practical resources which you can copy and paste so that you don't have to spend time thinking oh how am I going to write this letter or what do I need on a referral form or how do I train um, potential volunteers all those kinds of resources are there available for you to use I'm not going to tell you any more about the toolkit now because the next session um, details it um, a little more um, but do do bear in mind that it's there for you um, and thank you very much That's brilliant. That's Thank done, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much uh, to Nikki and to Larry. That's um, a, a really helpful overview of the situation to date. Um, so yes, now we'd like to hand over to Andy Henwood, who will talk us through the practical aspects of using that peer to uh, peer support toolkit. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to um, chat on here. Uh, can I firstly start by just uh, again, just reiterate our thanks to um, Kidney Care UK for their support that they're giving us throughout this. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to very much talk about the toolkit, but before we did that, I just wanted to um, put a little bit, bit of background to it. So York itself, just so that we're aware on the value of size, is about 900 kidney patients. 250 of those are on HD, 35 PD, and 550 of those patients are um, on tra transplanted. We've got one main hospital ward, one HD unit, a minimal care unit, three satellites and two self-care units. Um, and I would, I would also just uh, um, stress what Larry has just said in relation to that we've already had in the background of, of what we are doing, this informal peer support. So patients are talking to themselves whilst they are 
um, in the waiting room on transport or whatever. And we have the specialist nurses and the nurses on the various units who will put other patients in touch with each other. We are going down the slightly more formal side of that. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna take about 10 minutes or so just to talk about the toolkit. We'll talk a little bit more about what it is that we have done um, at York. And then we'll just give an example of one of those aspects of the toolkit that we just took a little bit further. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this was mentioned at the very beginning, and this is the, the pro program that we've got, the network that we have got is very much a collaborative approach. So it's a hospital approach. Um, we have three individuals that are doing that, one patient and two healthcare. So I am Andy Hemwood, I am a patient, four years on hemodialysis and 12 plus years on transplant. Um, and I've been involved now for about 15 years in various different aspects. Um, and we have Mel Largan and Dr. Lavoie. So, Mel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mel Lagan. Uh, I'm a hemodialysis nurse based at Harrogate Renal Unit, which is part of um, York and Scarborough Trust. Uh, I joined the peer support core team in August of 2020 in the capacity of a peer support nurse lead. Um, and my role is funded for the equivalent of seven and a half hours per week. Oh. Well, hello, I'm, I'm Paul LeBoy. I'm, I'm one of the kidney consultants in New York. Um, the, the, the majority of the work or the, the big bulk of the work is being done by Andy and Mel. And, and, it's, and so it should be because it's a patient-centered, patient-led initiative in New York. And we're really lucky to have both of them. Uh, I'll let Andy lead on after this. All right, thanks, Paul. Next slide, please, Mel. And we're going to have to work out. Yeah, okay. So we just stay there just for a second. So, <clears throat> as mentioned, it's a patient led collaborative model. Uh, both myself and Dr. LeBoy put in a joint application to Kidney Care UK. That got accepted literally just before um, COVID started. Um, and the way that we run that is that Dr. LeBoy is um, remunerated on his hours. I have two days a week, which comes out of the funding. And as Matt has already said, she does set a day, seven and a half hours. Next slide, please. Or next part, please, yeah. Just go through them, Mel. Um, so we have a, a regular core, core meeting every Thursday. Um, and the program itself is open to anybody from when they first touch the hospital, in other words, from primary care or um, straight into for a you know, an emergency reason, right the way through to they do conservative care. So we have the whole part of the kidney journey. Next, please. Um, we work very closely with the renal staff and the admin staff um, to inform and encourage uh, both the peer supporters and peers. Next one, yeah. Uh, we recruit um, patients, we train patients. Um, we have three two hour Zoom sessions. This is quite uh, informal, but actually it's in, li in line with other aspects, such as what the hospital might expect from the volunteer service, for example, but not to that same degree. As part of that, we've created WhatsApp groups, both staff and um, patients. We have newsletters, so we have a social network, and we have sort of three monthly get-togethers, and we continually review the programme. Next one, please. So currently we have 14 supporters, 12 patients and two carers, and our next course is being run uh, in January next year. Next, please. OK, so we're trying to make the most of the opportunities that everybody else that is involved or has been involved um, with peer support in the past and learn from what they've done. So um, oddly, Aleri was one of the first people that we spoke to in relation to how we might do what we're doing. So we're now in partnership with Kidney Care UK and we are supported by York Hospital. So it's a joint funding effort. Um, and we also have done some self-funding efforts ourselves. We're also part now of this re uh, regional sustainability. So we're working with Bradford, Leeds, Hull, Newcastle, as well as other aspects. Um, and clearly part of that, well, not clearly, but part of that is trying to help where we can with psychosocial care and using patients to help uh, in that process. Next slide, please. So the toolkit, you've seen that on Larry's um, slide already. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we'll go through this relatively quickly. We could talk about this for quite a while, but on the left-hand side is the various aspects within the toolkit itself. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through. Um, but on the right hand side, I'm hoping that you can read, um, we've broken down a, a couple of points from it. The pre-planning section is really helpful. Um, it gives you a good idea about the, what sort of types of activity you want to do. The, the fortunate thing for us is that we already had done an audit before the toolkit actually came out. So the toolkit was, was a really good um, audit of what we'd already done. Um, the links such as the resources, the training slides, the notes, the handbooks, all of that promotional aspect, which I will go through a little bit, uh, very briefly, a little bit later on, are valuable in relation to helping us to develop the, the process quick, uh, real, really quickly. Um, and we have adapted a considerable number of those. So we've built the training slides, we've expanded on the curriculum, um, we've edited the scenarios, we've got more um, York-based scenarios, and we have a lot of activity which we are now able to work with uh, with the multidisciplinary team. Um, the tips around establishing and facilitating that, that referral process are also helpful. Um, and we did our own referral really in York, uh, but we haven't actually used the stuff that was from um, the toolkit. Um, and who to refer, that particular section of the toolkit is really helpful. Next slide, please. Um, these are some of the, or the majority of the toolkit extracts that you can take out, which then help you to develop the program. Those with the A and the, the asterisks and the A, they're the bits that we've adapted. Um, th those that's got suit next to them are those that we've adapted considerably more than uh, what they were, and the ends are the ones that we currently haven't used yet. Um, but they are all worth looking at. They're all good examples and they're all various aspects that most of us from different hospitals will want to change and modify to suit the trust um, that we're in. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the examples of what we have done, um, which changed that. So on the left hand side, or the bottom right hand side, we have a, a website which we have used, we've created top left and then going across. We have a PowerPoint presentation, which we generally give out to uh, patients and one for staff. We have a leaflet, which we give out. And then we have a number of different notices from advertising the service through to training and dates. We adapted and used the handbook, which is from the toolkit itself. Uh, we've then modified that so it can go online as a, as a flip book. And a lot of that information that was in there <clears throat> goes into a staff folder, which sits on all the satellite and main units. We have training PowerPoint um, as well, which really affected our, our, over those three two hour sessions. And a lot of that again was initially taken from uh, the toolkit and then we've adapted that and then added to that. There's another example there of a newsletter, which we do. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the, the important aspect is to make sure that we engage with the multidisciplinary team within the, the kidney services. So. Um, the way that we have done that is we've gone to each of those different specialist areas and we have <coughs> asked for some simple, um, a simple activity for them to do. And I will caveat that with we try to keep the work that they are, we are asking them to do right to a minimum. Um, so we've asked them to produce a simple video, a three minute WhatsApp video, just explaining what their role is, uh, to provide one slide which encapsulates that role in case they're not there and we can um, go over that slide. One outlining their contact details, one outlining how peer supporters and them can work together, um, provide four typical scenarios of what they could expect to, a peer supporter to um, come across at York, which is why it's specific. Um, and then equally with that scenario, have a solution to that as well. So we have one, which is the question or the scenario, which we talk through, and then there is a solution. Um, and then just some of the, pitfalls that we might, uh, that either myself, Mel or Paul might find as we go through. Next slide, please. Oh, this is gonna be quite tiny. So the, the toolkit itself, the availability of the toolkit is really, really good. Um, and clearly it's online. So all, and all of that stuff can be downloaded and it can be accessed and it can be modified. Um, it's really useful. We keep going back to it. So it's a useful reviewing tool and it's a useful evaluation tool. And there are, are aspects in there which will help you to um, do with aspects around evaluation and measurement. Um, and the, 
it, it does give you an idea in relation to sustaining and running a peer support program, maintaining a pool of patients and identifying um, peer and staff engagement. How can we do that? And clearly, the more of, those of us that are using the toolkit, then the more there is of lessons to learn that we can share. As peer supporters, we could continually develop in this process. Uh, we try to keep regular contact with the peer supporters. We do that through email and those other aspects which I pointed out earlier on. Um, social events have, have been quite useful where patients can talk to each other. Um, we've created the website and the newsletter, the WhatsApp group, etc. And we're looking now how we can maximise the time that we spend with the group by trying to extract some of the stuff, the more obvious peer support stuff, to put it into something like e-learning for those that are able to, to get online and then where to maximize the time that we spend together. Um, Mel's just very quickly going to go through some of the staff aspects. Um, yes, thanks. So obviously sustainability is paramount um, for the continued success of the program we're developing. And so involving staff members has always been a key objective really from the start not just to enrich the supporter training, but also to ensure continued referrals uh, into the service. So um, a couple of the things we've done is uh, we've recruited local area champions. So the objective was to recruit at least one person from each renal unit, plus from uh, some of the specialists, uh, um, specialist uh, care areas as well to help promote the network. We've also created a staff WhatsApp group for MDT members and the local area uh, champions to be part of. And this allows for quick and easy communication, for example, of um, upcoming training dates or answer questions if they arise. We're um, collaborating with our renal clinical educator as well on facilitating regular staff education sessions going forward. Uh, which can hopefully, um, so we can catch new starters and um, the session can be a refresher for existing staff. Peer supporters, uh, peer support will also um, become a part of new starters nursing competencies going forward so that um, it really does become embedded in, in our service and in induction of new starters. And Andy's already mentioned and shown an example of the peer support resource file. The aim is to have that available on each of the renal units, as well as in the specialist um, care areas for staff to refer back to, as well as patients. So a resource for both staff and patients. Thank you, and, Mel. Yeah. Yep, sorry, thank you. Next slide. Okay, so just to finish off, um these are some of the just some of the aspects that we were thinking of really it's about trying to decide on the method that you've used and you've heard what richard has to say and ellery and nicola around some of those aspects that might influence what you're doing secure buying from those that really are, are really keen to do it the early adopters um have a good look through the toolkit and then try and take out of that to fit the model that you want and then come out with some form of work plan um try and engage other hospital departments where appropriate um We've been, I've been very fortunate as, a, as the patient lead that I have the support from um, Dr. LeBoy, but equally from other areas right across the hospital. That's from marketing to finance to other areas of uh, long term condition. Um, work closely with your early adopters. Um, under understand, and I'm sure we all do, that it takes effort and commitment, patience, and we need to walk before we can run. Um, and there are plenty of people, a lot of those sat on here today, that are willing to help. Um, so please do not reinvent the wheel. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Do not reinvent the wheel. That's excellent advice, Andy. Um, we've got a few questions um, for our speakers so far, if you're happy to take them now. Um, the first one um, is a, a sort of more general open question, I guess. Um, do people feel that peer support should be organised by individual trusts or can that be done on a regional level? Um, 
Andy, would you like to, to give your opinion on that to start with? And then maybe um, Nikki or Aleri would like to talk to that too. Okay, and, and I'm going to give a diplomatic answer. Clearly, it's both. I think the main aspect of the peer support from, is a hospital responsibility, which is the way that we've taken that. But equally, I think to make, for, we understand that for us to be supportive, we need the area, we need the region to be able to work with that as well. Um, so with the, there is no doubt that certainly as these new regional networks are being set up, that if there were regional peer support aspects that are working, and we're already doing it. So we're working with Leeds, with Bradford, with Hull. So, and it does work. And it's, and it's the more that we can do together, the more success the program's gonna have, the more um, traction it will get. Um, so my answer would be, yes, it's a responsibility of the hospital, but actually equally it is for the networks. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and I see in the chat that there's um, sort of lots of lots of debate around this. So uh, maybe we'll come back to this in our breakout sessions um, a little bit later. Um, I've a, a question on the survey. Um, so I don't know uh, whether Nikki or Larry would like to speak to this, but I noticed that uh, your peer support programmes pre-COVID were face to face or um, phone support and I just wondered if you had picked up um, anything around digital platforms for peer support. Um, maybe I'll just give a general answer and Leary can, can do the specifics. Um, from memory we didn't ask that because of course who knew what was going to come uh, the following year. Uh, so I don't think we had a specific question asking people about virtual support but um, Larry might be able to remember and also have a view Hi, yeah, um, I mean, life was very different, what, only three short or long years ago. Um, I think these days, you know, that there's there's much more expectation that a virtual form of peer support should be offered. Um, and I know that many units across the country have tried um, successfully um, to set up sort of group group Zoom meetings um, or, or Zoom video links between patients. Um, of course, we, we've had to protect our patients by making sure that face-to-face -face peer support um, was paused for a while. Um, and I think in a way it's been a good opportunity because it's, it's forced us to explore um, other ways of, of delivering peer support. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and Aleri, have you noticed that there was a, a drop off? Have people been slow to return to peer supporting um, since COVID and, and things are returning to face to face meetings and interaction? Um, in terms of the overall appetite for peer support, um, there, there wasn't a drop off as a result of COVID. In fact, I'd say the opposite. I think people were feeling you know, what people who, who were living with the effects of kidney disease were feeling more isolated in a lot of cases. Um, and I think it really galvanized an interest in peer support amongst healthcare professionals who, who sort of lots of people who hadn't expressed a, an interest in it before sort of then said, oh, actually I, I can really see how right now this, this is a crucial intervention to offer our patients. Um, and so, so I'd say the opposite. I think COVID has been um, really good for, for, <clears throat> for developing more enthusiasm and interest in peer support. Yeah, that's really positive. Andy, would you echo that experience? Well, yeah, and we, ours started right through, right the way through um, COVID. So, and I think in many ways that's done a favour. It's, it's pushed people onto things like more probably Zooms than Teams, but the, the the elder generation that we have within the programme are more than happy to sit on Zoom. There is always going to be those, that, and we have them already as well, who aren't quite happy to do electronic stuff. Um, and the eagerness to meet on a face-to-face, -face, particularly socially, um, has, well, it's, it's now fine. I mean, people are cautious, but they still do it. Yeah, um, and there's a, another, uh, or question or point uh, that's come up in the chat box what form of support exists for patients who are not literate or technologically literate and I, I think you know that speaks to that group of people that um, aren't so comfortable um, jumping on a, a Facebook live or, or whatever it is. 
That's good. Um, and Andy, um, another question for you, um, and I'm sure you'll be an equally political answer, um, but how much do you think the success of setting up your peer support group was due to the input from the nurse and the consultant within the unit? So you, you were working together with staff to establish that. Yeah, I don't think I need to be political. I think that with Mel and Paul, who are like excessive champions, it would not work without them. And I think, and that, that's in many ways why we like the process that we've got, that we have this equality in relation to, it is a patient-led program, but I, and clearly there are aspects that where patients can talk to patients, but without Mel and the support that Mel and Paul give to the consultants and to the nurses, it's, I mean, it's even with them, it's hard work. So, but they are so important, yeah. Yeah, and, and that was reflected a little in the survey as well, that support from, from unit staff to, to making a support programme a success. Is that, that correct? Yeah. Fab. Any more questions there from the chat? I'm just having a quick look through. Um, can I just mention one thing, Sarah, that, Please do. that Stella picked up, and I think and it's something I should have mentioned really, was the support that Kidney Care are giving to it to, to add this national aspect to it rather than just, so it's hospital, regional, national. Um, and I think that's ultimately important as well. Yeah, and I think, again, that's coming through in the chat, those different formats for, for people to engage with at, at different levels is, is really, there's no one size fits all, it's mm -hmm. looking like here. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Well, I think we're going to take um, a slightly earlier than scheduled break. We're, we're just five minutes ahead, which is lovely. Uh, but we're going to take a 15 minute break now. So um, a chance to refresh and then we'll come back together. Um, and we have um, a series of presentations looking at specific aspects of um, how to overcome those barriers um, in running a peer support service. So um, if we'd like to come back together at, uh, where are we, 2.40, um, then it would be really good to see you again. Then if you want to just stay on and, and mute and keep your camera switched off, um, that's great. And we'll pick up again in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody, um, welcome back. I'll just give a, a few moments for everybody to um, come back to their PCs with a, hopefully a nice cup of tea or at least leave the emails alone. Um, but good, good to have you back with us. Um, there's been some interesting comments and questions shared in the, the chat over the break. Um, so particularly around um, sort of resources for peer support for non-English speaking patients um, and ways to overcome cultural barriers. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to explore a bit more about that in the, the breakout groups that are coming up shortly. Um, and also the, the comments um, from Paul at York that, that you know dynamic patients are very much part of making a successful uh, peer group peer support group um, and so again something else that we can perhaps explore in the breakouts but before we um, we get together and have a chance to to talk through some of those issues um, we've got a, another lineup of um, very um, interesting aspects of peer support um, and how it works in practice um, from a variety of speakers. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're not able to welcome Della Iduwu this afternoon. Um, sadly, she was taken ill this morning, so she's not been able to join us. Um, she was due to be speaking around engaging people um, from African and Caribbean heritage, uh, which I think is something that, you know, again, has come up in the chat. So it would be good to explore that in more depth um, at another time. But we're going to move straight through to uh, Jackie Byford, uh, who's going to be talking to us now about buddying um, and being supported by a more experienced peer support screen. So Jackie, I'm going to hand over to you. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? We, yes, we can. Yeah, Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, I'm, I'm there now, I'm there now. <laughs> thank right. you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you um, for inviting me along today. Um, my name's Byfield, by the way, sorry, not food. <laughs> um, and I work for the um, North and East Hearts Trust in down near Hertfordshire. And our, our cover, we cover five units. It's uh, Luton, 
Luton, the Bedford unit, the Harlow, St Albans and the Stevenage unit. We have a peer support project. Um, my role, sorry, my role is to, part of my role, because we're fortunate, is to oversee the peer support the project that we have. Um, I was originally brought in um, three, three, two years ago, just at the beginning of the COVID, um, and it was already set up. So I wasn't around for the initial setup of the peer support, but I have been there, have been here since the beginning of the COVID, unfortunately, because that's when it all hit and it caused quite a lot of chaos. Um, but I've done a lot of learning, I've accessed a lot of support for that, and I thought it'd be good to share that and how that's helped me um, through the years and just say a little bit on how our peer support was set up. Um, do you want to go to the first slide? I, I, thank you. So for me, uh, me, I wanted to just talk about how peer support was about working collaboratively and how that's helped me as a, a, a sort of a, somebody who's responsible for developing the project, engaging people, uh, and can, to keep it continuing for a difficult time. And I think, you know, I think today I put to, like what today is all about: how together we can make a difference. Because I know in our, you know, within our trust, we're coming across some difficulties with some things, and I, um, and it's been fortunate for us that we've been able to sort of um, reach out to other peer supports to help us um, with things. So, next slide. Sorry. Um, so just to a little bit about the list of hospital, the list of hospital peers, uh, renal peer support was actually started off as a dream, um, as I said, before I came along. Um, and then with a little bit of research, um, and it was then Hope Clayton and Carol Gallagher, uh, and it was put under the um, psychosocial psych team, psychosocial work team. Um, and they did a bit of research and then they come across Earlywood at King's College um, and they, I think, um, Hope met with, um, I, I'm a bit vague about this because I'm not altogether sure, but Hope met with um, Ellery a few times and I think she, this was before the, um, the Kidney Care UK booklet came out, the peer support guidance came out. Um, and then from there, there was the sharing of ideas and knowledge and from there, could you, next slide please. The renal peer support at Lister Hospital was created with the support of the Lister Area Kidney Patients Association. That is a group um, that they're there and they do a lot of work for our patients within our area, uh, like support them, like a support group for them. And they do a lot of strategic stuff. Um, and they paid for my actual role in the, be in the beginning. So that was, you know, was, that's, the, that's why they're there and, and they're very supportive of us. My role has since then become a permanent role, but I also cover young adults, TDU patients, um, got to remember them all, CM patients, um, and um, I do I do like uh, grants and um, social care sort of tasks within the team as well. Um, so yeah, so from there with this this is this is where and this is where this is the team there. This is the first group that was ever set up and uh, with a training session. And so this would never have happened without the support and help from Ellery and her team and them um, connections that Hope managed to make at that time. Next slide. Of course, it was all running quite successfully, and then I came on board, and then COVID came. And I I come from a peer support background, but not in health. It was more with young people. Um, so it was, you know, in a different environment, different sort of policies and bureaucracies and stuff. So it was all, all a bit of a, <gasps> what do I do now? Um, so before I really had time to get into it, um, COVID hit and, you know, we had lockdown, social distancing, isolation. It, it was a bit chaotic, um, not just not just for, I mean, across hospitals. And I think you can all, all know about that experience. I don't need to go on about it. And of course, what it did create was I had to start thinking about new ways of working to meet patient needs. Um, coming in from somewhere completely different, I didn't, I wasn't really that sure, um, wasn't, wasn't really quite sure where to go. Um, so that's when I got in contact with um, other, so, next slide, sorry, I got in contact with, sorry, <laughs> with Ellery. Um, I did a bit of networking, I guess my networking really came, you know, I started to really network and try and find out what other people were doing. Um, and I got in touch with Ellery and she said what they were doing. And of course, we had a shared common interest. We were sort of trying, all trying, we were trying to achieve the same thing. Um, she was able to sort of talk to me about how they were addressing difficulties they faced and with the ones I was facing. And we had a sharing of ideas and practices and Ellery kindly um, invited me to one of her training sessions which was really helpful because I've not really done training virtually so she allowed me to sit in her session and, and sort of watch how it was oh, well it was four sessions I think or I think it was yeah four to sit in and actually um, learn how to how to deliver that virtually 
Um, and of course, then there was the sharing of materials, which would come from the um, handbook as well, the guidance, the, the peer support guidance that, um, that Ellery shared with me at that time, or parts of it, because I, I think it was just coming out as I started, really. Um, and of course, the outcome was I, we had a way to go forward within our team because it was all quite chaotic. We had a way to go forward with our peer support because um, that was where the telephone peer support came up. We haven't done the virtual because our trust is, um, it's all about confidentiality and we had, do you have Zoom, do you have Teams? And it caused quite a bit of a, a pickle with our trust. So we, we hadn't actually gone forward with the virtual, um, but we have done the phone, the phone service. Um, the support... Um, given enabled our service to continue the support I received from other people you know from from Ellery and the NKF at the time as well enabled my our team to sort of carry on providing the peer support and of course most importantly we're still able to meet patient needs it was different um, and actually I was surprised by how successful the telephone peer support was because it wasn't something I'd sort of seen being necessarily workable but it, it actually proved to be really positive um, with, I think Ellery's seen, um, I think Ellery's team have seen some of our patients because we've had issues with um, with training and things without some of, with the, within the trust, and so and and with some of our peer supporters um, unable to peer support anymore for health reasons, so I've had to, I've accessed support from Ellery's team and from the NKF to support patients that we've not been able to support so when we're talking here today about do we do it regional or, or locally I think actually both have proved for us have been really really useful because we still use the peer support as we've got but I've actually been able to um, you know share or, or, or get the support from other services for patients to to sort of fulfill the need they required um, and altogether, I think that comes to about, about 28, 29 of our patients. That's quite a lot of people that we weren't able to support um, and other services were. And I would, you know, the feedback I've had has been really positive. And I think that's just a really good example of how, you know, working together has actually helped our patients because that's what we're here for, isn't it? To get the best for the patients. Could you go to the next slide, please? Um, and of course, what well, I said, the, the attributes of positive networking here, because all the things that we've done to, to make this happen, the things that we've done, you know, we've trusted each other, we've shared stuff, you know, we've invited each other into things, we've had conversations. Um, and of course, this is, I think if we could all do this all, sort of, all together as a network, I think we could make things happen. So I think the, like others are saying, having one locally is um, good as well within our own trust, because that seems to work, you know, you get to know, um, the, the, I think we haven't got anybody going into the units. I go into the units to promote it, but I think listening to you talking about champions, you see that I like ask the units if they could have a champion staff member, you know, to sort of help me promote it in the unit. So, um, and to other and to other sort of health professionals. But um, these are the sort of attributes that I felt really brought us together, or, or that worked to to bring that about the collaboration and 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 really made a success for us. And I hope that. Um, for Ellery and and for the NKF where we've worked, you know, it, it's been a, a positive experience for them, but more importantly for the patients. But I think, you know, without that, without doing all these things, we, we wouldn't have made things happen for our patients. Next slide, please. Um, and these were some um, uh, uh, feedback from the peer supporters that we've had. I mean, the first one that the peer support had said, the session was absolutely amazing. The session really helped me and made a difference in my attitude thinking and my perception of my situation the sessions gave me hope that there was a light at the end of the tunnel I can't thank peer support enough please pass this on to the peer support that was the peer supporter so you know that you know that's just an example um, of, of the difference that it can make as we heard earlier actually of how peer support would help um, others here um, and the other one, the other quote was from a peer supporter because I think you know it's it's got to remember that the peer support is actually also gain a lot from what they offer that you know they gain from it and the one here is I remembered when I was first diagnosed and not having anyone outside of the medical professionals to speak and to what that had felt like for me sharing it and being able to support someone going through it felt good for me too um, and I think we have to be mindful that both you know peer support is actually beneficial to both parties in one way or form um, and relationships get built up and, and confidence and trust um, and, and that's, you know, this is, this is just an example of how successful it can be for the people that access it and for the volunteers that actually 
um, help us in providing it. Um, next slide, please. And so this is a slide I found I just liked it because I just thought, you know, by coming together is a beginning, then this was about us all networking. Um, keeping together is a progress because I think, you know, like I say, how we decide to go forward and the ways that we choose to do that and the bits that we can pick up from each other and working, you know, will be useful. And I think working together, hopefully, that um, it will be a success, you know, and it will help others develop and ourselves develop our peer support. So I've, I've heard things today that I think are going to help me. And actually, I've got to say, reinvigorated me because, you know, it's just been a bit tiring over the COVID. And I think, oh, what, what, what next? Because our, our supporters are not allowed to meet face to face yet at our hospital. Then the trust isn't allowing that yet. But um, I think this just sort of showed, I think this slide I liked because it just demonstrated what could happen and how, how you know, other, you know, patients are like nationally, like you say, across could um, be, could be supported and, and peer supports being developed. And, you know, the, as, as we were saying, just one here about the language barrier we have in that where we are, and I don't have peer supporters to speak to some of our patients because of the language barrier. And actually that's a problem I'm having. So if anybody, hopefully we can find a way of that today, that'd be great. Um, and thank you for listening to me. If anybody's got any questions, please ask. That, that's lovely. Thank you so much, Jackie. Okay. Um, and our apologies for um, getting your surname wrong there. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but I thought that was that really important as well to draw out the fact that peer support gives so much to the volunteer. Um, mm. You know, we, we look at the benefits a lot for, for patients, but actually the volunteers themselves um, find it so beneficial. So it's a win-win. That's great. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Joe Popham is our next speaker. Um, Joe's going to be sharing experience of running a regional peer support scheme. So um, Joe, can I hand over to you? Thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, my name is Joanne Popham. I'm the CEO of Popham K Kidney Support. Thank you to Kidney Care UK uh, for inviting me to talk to you today about how we established a service in Wales. Um, it, and this is very interesting to hear all um, that's happening around the UK. Uh, so thank you. Next slide, please. And that's me. Next slide, please. Um, this year, myself and two members of our steering group, uh, which I'll chat to you about a bit later, wrote a paper on how to um, establish a peer support service in Wales. And um, that's Dr Ash McHale, consultant nephrologist in Morrison Hospital, and Catherine O'Leary, renal clinical psychologist at that time for Cardiff and Vale Hospital. Um, and um, it was about how we started um, the service um, in Wales um, and what we believe to be the essential requirements for establishing and indeed maintaining that service. And in our opinion, we believe that to be a motivated team structure, a clear set of policies and procedures and funding. Um, so I'm gonna explore these three elements in, in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Um, so we believe to run a peer support service successfully is a motivated team structure. Um, and ours is made up of a facilitator. I think Larry mentioned champion earlier. It's a similar, um, so just a different term. Um, a steering group and a clinical psychologist. And they make up the core team that deliver the service for us in Wales. Um, a facilitator is um, the person who runs the, the uh, service on a daily basis. Um, in our case, it's somebody employed by our charity called a support service coordinator. They may lead and champion the service and will therefore have an understanding of kidney disease. They will be the person that matches the peer mentee, the person needing support to a volunteer peer mentor, the person affected by kidney disease who is trained to provide that support. And then the steering group are a group of individuals from a network or health board. So from our perspective, the Welsh Kidney Network. Um, who have an interest or desire to set up, deliver and develop a peer support service. Ours is made up of um, nurses throughout Wales, clinical psychologists, social workers and consultants. Um, and then um, the third uh, person that runs the service is a clin clinical psychologist who helps to train um, our peer mentors and support. I, I can't answer Kelly, I'm on Zoom. Next slide, I'm please. I'm on Zoom. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'll speak to you later. Clear. 
Yeah. Oh, oh, can I can I just ask everybody to make sure that they're Thanks. muted, please? Thank you. Next slide, please. I thought that might happen to me. So next slide, please. Yeah. Um, this, uh, the second essential requirement for establishing a peer support service in our perspective in Wales is a clear set of policies and procedures. And I think Larry mentioned governance earlier, which is exactly um, what, what we have. And that's made up of um, procedures for recruitment, training, facilitation, matching, managing and maintaining and rewarding um, our volunteers. And I'll discuss these in a little, a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. So our recruitment procedure includes having a clear role description, setting out a schedule of training programmes throughout the year, advertising um, the role and the training dates to the right audience, um, receiving interested candidates from uh, completed application forms, carrying out interviews, reference checks and DBS checks, in addition to a referral form from someone within the Reno team. When interviewing initially, we look, look for positivity, and I think Andy mentioned that earlier, and good listening skills. Over the last six years, we, um, we and those taking part in the recruitment process recognise they may not want to be or could become a peer mentor. Everyone has other skills and may be best suited to a different volunteer role. And it's always good practice in our perspective to have um, other roles that um, uh, we could we could uh, utilize the, the person for or they they might enjoy more than being a peer mentor next slide please um our training procedure includes completing an agored uh, course a peer mentor skills course um we it was originally um a course that um came from the renal team renal psychology team in cardiff um, and at the start of COVID, the steering group suggested that we um, that it became a certificated course, and we looked to a GORED to support us with this. Um, this course itself is ten hours and includes delivery delivery modules on the peer mental pathway, which includes active listening, delivering information to others, how to plan a session, guidelines on providing support, how to tell their own story, and looking after themselves. It also includes modules on the peer mental code of conduct, diversity and inclusion, confidentiality and safeguarding, and assessing their own practice and health and safety in peer mentoring. Uh, the training doesn't end there. They have to then complete an assessment, um, a post-course interview, and are monitored on their first few unit visits by an assessor. And um, every month, um, there's ongoing training, which we call supervision which includes an hour of sharing experiences in a confidential, uh, confidentially, of course. Um, and, and then a guest speaker is invited um, who can help them deliver the service. So, um, so um, things like that, where they can signpost um, the patient to, so if, if the patient is struggling on other things like employment, financial support, holidays, we have guest speakers coming in to talk to them about different things that they could signpost the patient to. Um, and twice a year then we also have a skills refresher training just to keep um, to keep to keep it all refresh in their minds. Uh, next slide please. Um, an essential part of delivery um, procedures how the facilitator matches peer mentors to the peer mentees. So initially the facilitator um, chats to the peer mentee about their situation and needs. Um, through the call, they will already be thinking of a peer mentor who would be able to help. And they will receive consent from the peer mentee to chat to suitable peer mentor about their background without breaking confidentially confidentiality until both parties agree to the match. The background and needs of the peer mentee is discussed with the peer mentor. If the peer mentor agrees to support them, then times and dates are taken of when they can make the first call and an agreement to share their information with the peer mentee. We then go back to the peer mentee to discuss the peer mentor and if happy, a time is confirmed for the peer mentor to call them. The peer mentor will call and not disclose their number to the peer mentee. The peer mentor receives uh, further details about the peer mentee, name, contact details and further information to help them support the peer mentee. Um, so you know, the question was raised about regional um, and local uh, support. So prior to COVID, it was definitely a local uh, support that we provided. But due to COVID, that opened up the accessibility throughout Wales. Um, and um, we have 
So our, our, uh, the Welsh Community Network covers um, uh, seven health boards. Um, we have peer mentors in Swansea and Cardiff and North Wales. And our Swansea based um, peer mentors are, have supported uh, all, uh, peer mentees in North Wales and Cardiff. So there is, a, there is the ability to do it um, as long as the background and um, the similarities in um, the, the peer mentee and the peer mentors um, circumstances so that they're able to provide that exact support. Um, we have also had calls about from, um, uh, uh, from, from patients with uh, uh, other languages um, and, and sadly at this stage uh, we're all English or Welsh speaking. Next slide please. Um, so one of the um, most important or one of the greatest aspects um, of our procedures to manage and maintain the volunteers and I think it was asked earlier in the question about how uh, uh, do you have a small team and um, do they change consistently um, ours have been with us since the start um, and have grown and, and we've been lucky to maintain them um, and this is purely because we make sure that we appreciate um, appreciate their support um, each of them re receives a, a certificate for completing their Agora qualification we acknowledge their achievements on social media and on our website we communicate achievements to the wider community through our newsletter and press releases to the local paper with their consent. We hold an annual volunteers thank you celebration. We nominate volunteers for external awards. We send cards, uh, uh, flowers on different occasions, on special occasions. And um, we, we, we also meet once a month um, as part of the ongoing training process. Next slide, please. Um, it's also been mentioned throughout the presentations earlier about collaboration, and that is also part of our policies and procedures. Um, it's essential to raise awareness of the service and to encourage referrals to the service. So we collaborate with the MDT teams throughout Wales, a health and well being group which is run by the Welsh Kidney Network. We collaborate with the Welsh Kidney Network and Charity in Wales to ensure that uh, together we are informing our community of the services available to them at all times. We collaborate on proms through the group and we, um, prior to COVID, we organised unit visits for our volunteer peer mentors to visit patients while they were dialysing. Next slide, please. Um, the third and final essential is a part of establishing the peer support is funding. Um, to pilot the services back in 2016, we had a, a three-year grant from Change for the Better from the Swansea Bay University Health Board. Um, and in 2019, we received further funding from the National Lottery. National Lottery. Um, and as a result of that, we've been able to um, support and um, to develop the service at, in North Wales. Next slide, please. Um, so to conclude, providing peer support for those affected by kidney, kidney disease, I think everyone agree, agrees here today. Um, is, it, is a useful tool to help patients adjust to their chronic illness, make informed choices regarding their treatment options and provide better patient compliance with long-term therapies. In Wales, this seems um, fully dependent on our, our support. It is our goal for the service to evolve in the future to become embedded with it in the clinical service to enrich patient experience. And our five-year goal is to have a consistent and even spread of volunteer peer mentors throughout Wales. I mean, you can read more about how we establish the service in, um, in the Kidney Care uh, Kidney Journal. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, this is a quick summary of how we established a peer support service in Wales since 2016. It's an ongoing process to ensure we have the right motivated team, continually developing our policy and procedures and ensuring funding is available to support the service. Thank you for listening. That's brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. And um, really interesting the, the way that you've structured your um, peer support service there so that there is ongoing support for the peer supporters themselves, which has become a, a subject in the in the chat bar there. Um, so, yeah, one way of approaching it. Thank you. Um, now, our next presentation is by video. Um, 
This is uh, Jyoti Baharani, who has um, created this short video for us, um, making peer support opt out instead of opt in. So um, techies, take it away. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jyoti Baharani. I'm a, a kidney doctor from Birmingham. I work at Birmingham Heartlands Hospital. Uh, thank you very much to the organisers for asking me to come and speak to you about our experience of using a peer support uh, and a peer education process at Birmingham Heartlands Hospital. I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person and I hope that the information I'm about to share with you will be of some use to you all. I want to start with a very famous quote made by Mark Michael Marmot as part of his um, publication in 2010, when he said that most health inequalities result as a result, result from social inequalities. I think it's important to remember um, that as healthcare professionals, it is certainly not within our gift to address all social inequalities, but that there are some social inequalities that we can address, starting with the healthcare system within which we work. Providing linguistic and culturally competent care and enhancing the quality of care that we provide should be something that we aspire to do on a regular basis and peer education is just one of the pillars that we can use to do this. I want to draw your attention to this slide that looks at the use of home hemodialysis or home dialysis per se in the West Midlands from 2014. West Midlands has seven dialysis units and Heartlands is one of them. You will notice that in 2014 we had the lowest use of patients. Um, we had the lowest use of patients dialyzing at home with just a mere 6% dialyzing at home, with the highest being 27% and our nearest challenger being about 13%. Happened because of a number of reasons. Um, I'd like to say we are different, but no more different than any other aspect of the West Midlands. But Birmingham is quite different in that it is the seventh most deprived local authority nationally and the third most deprived core city in the United Kingdom. Around Heartlands, we have some of the most deprived wards in the country. Our population is from very is from a very diverse multi-ethnic background. And as such, health literacy is very poor, with most of our patients having the reading age of between seven and nine years. In addition to this, um, we also have a very busy front door in that we have the most busy accident and emergency department in the country and our maternity service is also touted as being the busiest in the country. Um, we were also in the past uh, responsible for you know providing a one size fits all approach to education um, in the pre dialysis setting and i think if you put all of that together it was no surprise really that home dialysis wasn't really championed and that we were allowing patients to make decisions which were perhaps not in their best interest so we decided to do something about it and in order to address this, we embarked on a project together with Kidney Research UK, looking at the use of peer educators in the community with the aim that the numbers of patients choosing to have a home-based dialysis treatment would increase. We also partnered with industry um, to help us do this, as well as the clinical staff at the dialysis unit at Heartlands. We used the right messenger approach that Kidney Research UK has used for some time now. They have a rich history of using peer educators across the CKD pathway, but this was the first time we embarked on asking them to address um, education and advanced CKD and dialysis modality information giving with the use of peer educators. They had previously used it mainly in transplantation. I also am particularly fond of this quote that education is the most powerful we weapon which we can use to change the world by Nelson Mandela. Uh, peer educators were recruited from the vicinity as well as the nearby um, South Asian community because this is the population that we wished to target and this was the population that was the most hesitant to choose a home-based hemodialysis, home -based dialysis modality. Uh, we went down the route of accrediting the uh, 
training that we were giving the peer educators via the Kidney Research UK route. Um, the training was provided and then we deployed the peer educators uh, in a fashion that hasn't been used before. Uh, we used peer educators, uh, we had used peer support previously, but had found that most patients did not feel the need to use or see or speak to peer supporters. So we decided that we would use our peer educators in a novel way. We would make them part of our pre-dialysis pathway. Um, you know, we use um, all the MDT uh, at, in our pre-dialysis service and we don't say that it is optional to see a dietitian. So we applied the same prospect to pre, pre, peer education. We used the peer educators in clinics, so they were part of uh, the process of seeing, they, they went through the process of seeing patients. Um, if we felt, if the clinicians felt that they needed to see a peer educator, we used them and deployed them on home visits together with the nursing staff to give information to the patients um, in the language that the patients uh, preferred. And we also used the peer educators to make ad hoc calls to patients who weren't entirely sure about uh, kidney failure and had further questions to ask about dialysis modalities. I think I would like you to remember here that you know there is something that peer educators have in common with patients that we don't. And these are commonality, solidarity, and empathy, which as healthcare professionals, we do display, but we don't have those on a transfer transferable level as peer educators and peer supporters do. I think there are several elements of success within our story that require to be highlighted here. Peer education is another level of healthcare delivery. It's not optional to see a dietitian, so why should it be optional to meet and speak to a peer educator? It's important to deci decide beforehand um, what group you are wanting to engage or target. And I think for us, it was really important that we had a peer education coordinator overseeing activity so that we did have the right amount of peer educators in clinics, so that we did have the right person speaking the right language accompanying a pre-dialysis nurse at home. Having said that, it is important to script, but I think you also need to leave it fluid. If you're very prescriptive in your work, you know, you will not be able to achieve the, the, the the desired effects. We use peer educators in clinic, we use peer educators on home visits and also for phone calls, um, you know, for follow up to make sure that patients were happy with the decisions they were making and if they had any further questions. I think it's important when you embark upon using peer educators or peer support that you are unconventional. Ask your peer educators how you feel they should shape the service. They have plenty of ideas, but it is very rare for peer educators to actually be asked to be actually part of the patient pathway and to help modify or change your service. It requires a lot of bravery and I but you, you know I would like to think that fortune favors the brave. Um, this is a picture of all our wonderful peer educators, many of which still provide us with some services. Um, you will note that John uh, who is at the back of the, the crowd is not South Asian, but he was very keen to be involved. He's one of my peritoneal dialysis patients who's now transplanted and actually had a lot of commonality with our elderly patients who were not sure if dialysis was for them or not. Um, they say a picture speaks a thousand words, so I'm going to leave you with this picture which shows the um, change in our population dialysing at home. Uh, we have since not been able to continue with the peer education process in the way we wanted to, partly because of funding issues and partly because of COVID. But I would like to think that peer education and peer support was the spark that lighted the flame for our home therapy service at Birmingham Heartlands Hospital. I would just like to leave you uh, with a few final thoughts. I think um, if there is something stopping you from making that transition, then don't let it. Uh, if you make a mistake, you can always say sorry later. Uh, you need to have your team on board. It's important that you have a chat with your team, but at the same time, have the courage to begin so that you have the courage to succeed. I'd like to end really with um, 
thank you to my wonderful kidney failure support team at Heartlands Hospital, to Nirja Chain, who uh, works for Kidney Research UK and is their programs manager and was instrumental in helping us set up this service. Kidney Research UK for giving us the money to help um, you know, set up the service. And finally, to our wonderful peer educators, many of whom uh, we have still kept in touch with. My um, email as well as Twitter handle is on this uh, slide. And I'd be very happy for any of you to get in touch with me in the future to discuss our program or to discuss some collaborative work if need be. Many thanks again. Uh, that was a, a brilliant case study. I'm sure you'll agree using peer supporters to achieve a specific outcome um, and embedding them right in that pathway um, is, um, yeah, I'm sure there's lots of food for thought for people there. Okay, um, our last of our presentations in this series, uh, we're going back to Ellery Wood, um, who's going to talk to us about promotion, because you might have the best peer support service ever, but unless you can um, promote it to people, it's not going to go very far. So, um, Ellery, over to you. Thank you. Um, Yes, so um, it is interesting to hear, isn't it, these these case studies um, about how different people in different units or different parts of the country have have tackled the barriers to patients receiving peer support in different ways. Um, and again, you know, the, the one size fits all doesn't fit all <laughs> message um, applies to peer support services as, as well as sort of the, the peer support itself. So what I'm going to talk about um, is how to address uh, lower than usual referral rates. Um, you can move on to my first slide, please. Um, and how actually tackling um, or helping our healthcare professionals understand and promote peer support more is one of the ways that um, we've found successful in overcoming this barrier. Um, both at King's and across other kidney units who I've been in contact with over the years, there's, there's often been quite a frustrating um, low uptake of peer support. And particularly when you invest lots of time and energy into setting up a service. And, um, you know, very disappointingly for, for patient volunteers who've, who've come forward and, and have been trained and, and are really raring to go, there is very frequently that this lull and actually this lack of, of patients being referred in, of people coming in to receive peer support. Um, so I'm gonna talk you through the data which shows what I discovered when um, I did a service evaluation at King's College Hospital a few years ago, and the impact of a packet of interventions that we put in place to, to try to overcome some of the problems we identified. Next slide, please. This gives you a, a bit of an idea um, over time as to the number of referrals that we were receiving. The time which I'm gonna particularly be um, talking about today is sort of roughly in the middle of that slide. So it's about 2010, 2011. And you can see that at that time, our peer support service at King's was only receiving four to six referrals per quarter. So that's just one or two patients per month who, who were benefiting from this program that had been set up. Um, so there was a, there was a we had much more capacity and yet you know we felt there was a demand there but why was why was that demand not actually sort of coming and knocking on the door and saying yes we want peer support the service evaluation revealed sorry i just muted myself trying to forward the slide could you forward the slide please um so we identified one potential reason why this was happening the lack of um breadth in the number of clinicians who were truly engaged with the service and referring patients in. Consultant two is a medical consultant who um, is, was involved with the peer support service from the off and very engaged with advanced kidney care. And nurse three was me, yours truly. And you can see that actually there were very few other people in King's who were referring patients for peer support. And this was despite there being there being a lot of, you know, on the face of it, enthusiasm across the unit. You know, all of the clinicians who I worked with were always very proud of the fact that we had an active peer support service. 
Um, but you can see from here that we were only receiving a smattering of referrals from allied health professionals and junior doctors. Um, we had 12 medical consultants in the unit, but only six had ever made a peer support referral. And when it came to the nurses, um, it was only really the two nurses in advanced kidney care um, who were specialists um, and who, who had made more, more than one or two referrals. And we'd had no referrals from nurses who were at a grade lower than band seven. So this clearly showed to us that one of the barriers to peer support being used better in our unit was that we were not getting enough engagement from our, um, our healthcare professionals. Um, so what are we gonna do to address that? Next slide, please. Well, we thought, let's come up with a package of interventions. Let's scattergun it. Let's try lots of things to try to get more of the clinicians across the unit engaged in the service. And we think that that will feed through to patients. Patients will hear about it more and will be referred more. Um, uh, if we could move on again, please. We had sort of a, a comparison stage, the before stage, while we were sort of making our plans and, and identifying the problem. And that was October 2010 to March 2012. And during that stage, you know, peer support was available, but there wasn't any sort of promotional activities or we weren't doing anything to, to, to drive the peer support service forward. The second stage, which we call AFTER, was the 18 months from April 2012 to September 2013. And during this stage, we implemented our package of interventions, um, which if we move on, I will tell you about in a little more detail. So the interventions were designed to do three things. They were designed to help make sure that as many of our staff members as possible were aware that peer support was there, because sadly, uh, not all of them were. We then, once people were aware of it, we wanted to make sure that they were motivated to actually be involved in it. And by involved, I just mean sort of talk about it and, and promote it to patients. So we wanted all our staff members to, to really feel that it was a good thing and to understand how it could help each of their patients and to really feel enthusiastic about it being a valuable resource to point patients towards. And then thirdly, we wanted all of our staff to be confident that if they did talk to a patient about it, that they could talk about it in, in, in a helpful way, in the right way. They knew exactly sort of perhaps how to introduce it, what words to use, how to describe it. And that if the patient said, oh, yeah, that sounds good. What do we do next? That that staff member was confident that they did know what to do next and that they did know how to access the service and how to, how to sort of complete the loop and make sure the patient did get the support that they were interested in. And if we click on, please, the interventions that we designed to do that were we presented and joined in with discussions across the unit, um, specialist team meetings, so the dialysis meeting, the advanced kidney care meeting, academic meetings, um, care group meetings, um, particular staff group meetings, so you know that the senior nurse meeting, the, the registrar meetings, we went to them all and we, we tried to, to, to sort of help people understand what peer support was and, and, and how to access it. We followed that up with regular update emails every few months. Um, it felt a bit to me like I was being repetitive, but of course, peer support is, is, is up towards the front of my mind, but that's not true for everybody. And actually just sending those regular updates, partly to update people to say, oh, look, this is potentially something new about the service since we last told you anything about it, but also just to remind people it's still there. Still there, still waiting for your referrals. Um, so regular update emails, and by regular, I mean about every three to six months um, as something that we started doing. We made sure that there was an increased prominence of posters and leaflets. And it surprises me that when you put a poster up, um, I can walk away from it and I assume that it's still there a couple of years later. But of course, when I went round to each of our waiting areas or each of our dialysis units, I found actually that you know posters had been taken down or leaflets had all been used up. And so actually you need to more proactively make sure that those posters are replenished or that you update them and put a slightly different poster up to sort of catch people's eye again. So that was an important part. We tried to make introduction to the service part of formal induction. This was a bit more time consuming than the others because people start 
you know, sort of in dribs and drabs. Um, but certainly it's it's one surefire way of making sure that each individual um, professional who joins your um, renal team does know about peer support. We tried to get increased involvement of all staff. So they felt that it was that it was that it was their service to be a part of um, and to have some influence over um, and we did that through these individual conversations um, and through setting up um, a sort of working group as well which anyone was welcome to, to come and join in with um, and to contribute their ideas to um, and we also just invited when we sent out that email reminder you know please respond if you've got ideas or comments about the service and we also introduced new specific time points at which we um, could encourage our staff to offer peer support so that they could really feel that they were um, they were doing the right thing by offering it at that time. They could be more confident. So it was already offered as standard when patients entered advanced kidney care. And we set up two more time points, which was actually as they were leaving their advanced kidney care and about to start dialysis. And then... They were, um, it began to be offered as routine by the dialysis teams when the patients first got reviewed on dialysis. Um, and there were sort of posters up um, and stop, have you offered peer support signs to help people remember those new time points at which offering peer support, peer support was, was a standard expecting part, expected part of the care given. What effect did we have? Let's move on to the next slide. And we can see that the number of referrals uh, nearly doubled. Um, in fact, I think it did just about double at one point. So we clearly did have an impact. Those interventions did result in many more patients in our unit benefiting from peer support. Um, of course, one of my concerns was, well, does that just mean that the two clinicians who were making all the referrals previously were just doing more and, and we still didn't have buy-in across the rest of the unit. Um, but if we move on to the next slide, we can see that happily that wasn't the case. We actually also pretty much doubled the number of individual um, clinicians who were referring in to the service. So we had very much increased the engagement of staff across our unit. Next slide. Next slide. So I didn't need that. Thank you. Um, so in summary, we did feel that um, that we showed that increasing clinician engagement and, and how they felt um, and how e competent and confident they were in talking about peer support was vital and that we had increased that by implementing a range of strategies. Um, and that as a result, we had increased how much peer support was used in our unit. Um, I suppose just the proviso is that you have to keep doing them um, because, you know, the, the, there's always more people coming through, there's always more people who need to be reminded, um, and there's always other projects which can slip up and take priority. So these aren't just sort of a, a, a one-off intervention, but if you really want you to maximise the benefit of the support which you put your, your sweat and blood and tears into setting up, then you have to keep doing these promotional um, interventions. And that's all from me. I hope that's been useful. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you, Larry. I think I think you're right there. It's the communication. Even if you think you've communicated too much, you just need to go out and say it all again. Um, you've got to get that message across. OK, great. we are seeing lots of activity in the, the chat group, which is fantastic. So I'm going to let you off the leash now. We're going to break out into four groups um, and each group is going to be led by a facilitator. And that will all happen automatically. Okay, well, welcome back. I, I, I'm, I certainly our session flew by. We covered a, a huge amount of of ground there, um, and some just began some really an interesting discussions. I think that there's there's a lot to be um, explored uh, before maybe we can even start to ask answer some of the questions that that were posed here on the slide. Um, but I am going to go to um, each of the group facilitators in turn and and just ask what uh, your group um, discussed and and any sort of conclusions that you might have drawn from that discussion. So uh, can I start with Nikki, please? I was caught on the hop there. I thought I was going to be second. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so you need to tell me when you're starting that clock, because I know I've only got two minutes. Can't hear you. Have you started? 
<laughs> Sorry, Nikki. Yes, your time starts now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so moving forward, um, we had a lot of discussion about time and money. And I think generally what healthcare professionals in my group felt was that in order to get it going, there has to be protected time for people and that has to be funded in some way. And we had some discussion about the ways in which funding uh, could be achieved. Um, what do you need? So I've picked out some themes. So the themes were, I think there was some discussion about convincing colleagues whether it works or not. So some evidence, and maybe we need to make that a bit clearer, maybe on, on the website or in the toolkit. Um, there was discussion around education. So education on all sides. So whether it was healthcare professionals, understanding the benefits of peer support, how to refer and from the peer supporters themselves. Uh, we had a bit of discussion about whether we could have a national model, whether there could be Kidney Care UK could support some national training, which is just like getting started, but then there could be local training to sort of um, localise the, the, the peer support model in, in different trusts. Um, we spoke about network supporting people, so whether we could do that within the, the existing uh, renal networks that, that are available or whether there could be peer support networks. We spoke a bit about that. Um, and then the next three months, we had all sorts of things. Buy-in from senior staff, really, really important. Finding out what's been done already. So some people said, oh, I think we had peer support. Not sure if we got it now. Um, having nurse champions, identifying people who would move the programme forward, thinking about patient experience and training. So how are we going to do that? That's really, really critical for a good peer support programme. Uh, some people said they're going to download the toolkit because they weren't familiar with it. And finally, um, there was a lot of talk about supporting each other, so, so buddying with other units. Um, and I know Aleri does a lot of that already, like supporting people, getting things going, but maybe we could do that more formally. Uh, so hopefully that's my two minutes. <laughs> On the nail. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Happy experience. <laughs> oh, you set the bar high there. Um, Holly, would you like to, to feed back on your group's uh, discussion now? Yes, I would. And thanks very much, Nikki. You have set a really high bar. <laughs> but I think what came out of our group's discussion was how what can help to make peer support move forward for different units is having, you know, one or two champions identified within um, members of staff or other people who can spread the word, share with their colleagues, this is the impact that a peer support programme can have or is already having and encourage patients to to want to take it up to want to provide peer support as well as take advantage of it um, another really strong theme that was raised was the importance of training um, and also support for those patients who are providing peer support for instance if they run into a situation that is concerning to them or beyond what they are equipped to deal with where do they go with that? Who do they take it to to say this person requires more input than just um, peer support? And in terms of support that people would need, it's come back to that again. We had a couple of people in our group who are um, patients who are involved in various peer support programs already saying that they feel like they certainly need support for themselves as well, not only to equip them to to provide the peer support, but also to help them manage, you know, things that they might be dealing with at the same time, bearing in mind that they are also kidney patients themselves, um, along with assistance and promoting the programmes, coming back to what Aleri shared earlier, saying that it's all very well to have a peer support programme, but if people aren't coming into it to, to take it up, then it can't um, be sustainable. It needs enough enough structure to keep it going, along with you know sharing examples of good practice where it has worked well. Um, and the final question was encouraging um, people to share their learning with the colleagues. So people who've attended here today going away and telling their peers, this is what has come out of this webinar. Um, raising the idea in the first place in some cases and also focusing on the impact that it has focusing on the positive saying this is an amazing thing um please please do get involved in it yeah well done holly just crashed the two minutes there but, but thank you that's really helpful um right larry resetting um would you like to feed back on on the discussion that your group had please thank you um 
so it was great to hear um, in our group, you know, people had felt that this afternoon had given them quite a bit of inspiration and they enjoyed hearing the different ways that different units were doing it and that those case studies perhaps need to be made available in an ongoing way and perhaps that they could, there could be some kind of live document or some kind of way of um, people continuing to add and and everyone who's who's been a part of today's discussions to sort of perhaps add their top tips and what they learn as they as they try things out in their areas so that was one of the suggestions to try to sort of um overcome the problems which which each of us are experiencing which i think in the group there was quite a lot of agreement um about what those challenges were for some of us um and the other um, big suggestion that I want to mention, which we talked about um, a little bit in our group, was about how um, we, can, we can have very enthusiastic uh, people on the ground. And in our group, there were some excellent patient representatives of people who really have been given peer support over the years, probably as in an informal way, and who want to, to do it better and do it in a more structured way and be able to reach out to more people um but how they they were lacking sort of senior champion senior engagement for, and you know it, it it really is an uphill struggle a mountain to climb if you haven't got the the senior leadership in your unit on board and so there was an ask that perhaps either this forum or kidney care uk could somehow um use some clout from above to help um, garner a bit more of an impetus amongst the, the leadership um, in the healthcare professionals and across the renal community to, to make this happen. Brilliant. And there you are on two minutes. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's no um, accident that I left myself to last because I think it's you know picking up on a lot of the themes that came out in in the other group discussion but certainly up there was the importance of having the buy-in from the healthcare professionals on the unit so they really understand what what's what's it all about um, and how to refer people into it with confidence. Um, we also talked a bit around um, getting something started and, and this idea that it shouldn't be a project because projects um, rely so much on there being the funding in place for the whole um, session, there being the staff, the same staff in place um, while the project is going ahead um, and this sort of running out of passion. So it's got to be something that, that comes up um, from the, the group that it's benefiting um, as much as being something that's implemented um, from above. Um, and I think we also talked about um, the need for peer support to be um, peers at that point where you are um, on your treatment program. So you're go if you're at diagnosis, it's helpful to speak to somebody about their diagnosis. When you get to dialysis, when you get to transplant, those are very different situations. And to be able to speak to people who have been in, in that exact situation is, is really helpful. So, so some kind of, um, uh, we talked about a, a peer support cafe um, that, that looks at those um, specific topics um, is a helpful way to introduce it. Um, and coming back to this, there's not one size that fits all. Um, the, the use of online and um, digital communication has been really important in some people's peer support experience. Um, for others, that getting together one to one um, is invaluable. So it, it, there's, there's no one model um, and it's trying the things that fit for you. So there I am, just under my two minutes. Um, and I think the next, there I go. <laughs> the next um, section really starts to pick up on what's Kidney Care UK um, role can play in this. And I think, you know, I'm going to say already we have a fantastic peer support group in our young adults. Um, kidney group, which is a, a Facebook group um, that's led by Holly with a, a group of peer supporters. Um, and that's something that, that's really organic. It, 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 it's grown from itself um, and the young people all support each other. Um, and so it's kind of building on those sorts of successes um, and the toolkit that we're so proud to host um, and, and sort of looking at the different models that are out there um, that we can start to bring peer support into 
into renal care. Um, because I think what we've all heard over this last couple of hours is how important that peer support is to, to the care and well-being of, of a kidney patient. So it's really something that uh, would be good to, to put some extra impetus behind. Um, not to try and impose one model, I think, but it is about working with people at, at different levels, whether that's trust, regional, um, national, um, really using the experience that's already out there um, and looking at how we can translate that to be useful services for, for uh, kidney patients up and down the UK. Um, and I think my, my call for that is, twofold. First of all, if, if that's something that you'd like to be actively involved in, we would love to hear from you. So there'll be a, a sort of follow up email um, from this symposium. So please respond to that if that's something that you'd like to actively be looking at how we can take peer support out in a a wider way. Um, but also if you are interested in in getting together with other ex um, experts, professionals working in peer support at whatever um, stage of your peer support setup you're at. Um, it, it's just helpful to come together to peer support each other. So if that's something that you'd be interested in, in continuing to take part in, um, I'm sure that's something that, that we can look at, at delivering on a regular basis so that we can all get the chance to get together um, and meet each other. Um, I think that's that's pretty much all I want to say on this for now. Um, I'm going to hand over to Eleri for uh, the final remarks, um, and then I'm sure um, Paul Bristow, as ever, would like to have the last word. But Eleri, would you like to, to summarise the, the session for us, please? Thank you. Um, at the risk of sounding grandiose, I've been dreaming of getting people across the country together to talk about peer support for kidney patients for years and and I've just realized that it's happened we've made it happen and I'm I'm so thrilled with that and I need to say thank you to everyone who's helped to make that happen and I've made myself a list because when I did my wedding speech I forgot to thank so many people so I want to thank Kidney Care UK for hosting um, and for the admin support and the tech people and the people who've been sending out the invitations and the reminders who have all been amazing and well done. It's, it's gone really smoothly. I'm very impressed. Um, I'd like to thank Sarah for chairing and all of our speakers who've contributed um, really useful and, and thought provoking um, information and, and, and ideas for us to, to take away from today. I want to thank everyone who's attended, who's contributed to the chat, who's joined in with the discussion groups, because this isn't that we didn't want this to be just sort of us talking to you. We wanted this to really be a, a group um, uh, which which would all talk to each other and really collaborate. And I hope that we can can move forward to that. I need to make one apology, which is to Jackie, because it is my fault that your name was wrong on that slide. And so I'm very sorry about that. Um, I hope. That, that you've all found something about today useful um, and that it'll lead on to more collaboration locally, regionally and nationally, exactly what form that's going to take, you know, remains to be seen. Um, but I think it's quite clear that we do all share, you know, that the amount of agreement today has been brilliant in terms of how we think it's, you know, peer support should be more available, how useful it can be for anyone who's affected um, by living with, with kidney disease. Um, there's, there's much more work to do, but today's been a really exciting step forward. Um, and thank you for coming and I hope to see you all soon. And I will hand over to Paul, who's gonna have the last word. I feel really guilty now having the last word. Uh, I'll make this brief, everyone, because it's been a long afternoon. But first of all, just to add my thanks to uh, uh, to all of you for coming and taking part so actively. Uh, a huge thank you to Nikki and Ellery, who have done so much um, to, to spearhead and lead on peer support for so many years and have put so much work into today. So a huge thank you there. And a thank you to my comms team here who have uh, have done a lot of work to, to make this happen. So thank you all very much. I am a believer that lots of little individual voices often don't make systemic change, but I do believe if we can keep together and 
grow the noise and the need for patient support and speak powerfully with one voice, then I really do think we can take this forward. So as Sarah says, um, do stay involved, do agree to stay involved. And I think between us, we can carry the message and actually drive change, which I really do believe we can. So a huge thank you to everyone. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all very much indeed.